Okay, here we are. Welcome, welcome everyone. If you wouldn't mind uh, throwing into the chat room where you are from. Love to see who we've got uh, this Friday, February 3rd, 2023. I can tell you all that this last week has been a real doozy here in Austin, Texas. We've had a cold snap that doesn't agree with Austin, Texas. The infrastructure just is not built to handle these kind of situations. We had all kinds of freezing rain that was um, <laughs> that was really really brutal on the uh, on the town. In fact, we had as of yesterday, we had close to 160,000 Austinites that were without electricity. All these trees got all this frozen rain on them, and it caused literally hundreds of thousands of tree limbs to fall on top of electrical wires, cars, houses, uh, streets, and it made for quite a doozy of a week. But today, for the first time since Monday, the temperature is going to get above probably 34 degrees, and so we're all looking forward to this. Ah, hey, y'all. <laughs> Good to see everybody. So today, let's dive into eat more plants because you know what? Your life depends on it, and it absolutely does. So what I'd like to do to start out, and I'm probably going to talk for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then what I'd love to do is take some, some questions from you guys. So let's level set. Uh, just to kind of get things going. And according to the CDC, roughly one in three Americans has high blood pressure. It's, it's kind of crazy how many people are medicated for hypertension. One in six of us has what's considered high cholesterol, which is really anything over 200. Although the crying shame here is that 35% of heart attacks occur in people that have a total blood cholesterol between 180 and 200 milligrams, 200 milligrams per deciliter. And so even that is not doing the trick and that's not considered elevated. Um, we have one out of two of us, doesn't matter if you're male, female, uh, or what color your skin is that are dying from some form of cardiovascular disease. One, in nine of us is considered to be type two diabetic, but which it, when you also factor in pre-diabetes, it's almost one in three Americans is pre-diabetic or type two diabetic. 70% of us on average are overweight or obese, which is absolutely just kind of getting crazy. Now, some other, some other kind of numbers I'd like to share with you. Less than 23% of us are getting the recommended daily amount of exercise, which, which is just 20 minutes a day. 50% of America's calories are coming from flour, oil, and sugar. 50% from flour, oil, and sugar. 9% of Americans are now getting the recommended daily vegetable intake, which is just two to three cups per day. So just to kind of level set on that, one cup is the equivalent of two medium carrots. It's also the equivalent of five or six broccoli florets or one bell pepper, one small sweet potato, one ear of corn, uh, one large tomato. I think you get the, the gist of this. You know, one fist size serving of steamed kale, Swiss chard, uh, arugula, something like that. So only 9% of us are getting the recommended daily amount of vegetables. Only 12% of us are getting the recommended daily fruit intake, which is just one and a half to two cups. And I would consider uh, a cup just a piece of fruit. So like, for example, this little sumo orange here would be considered a serving size, uh, a banana. So you get the gist there. Um, 
we have pediatric obesity that has tripled uh, recently. And um, we have almost one in eight Americans that now fit the criteria for alcohol disorder. So it's not a very pretty picture that's, that's been painted here. And the reality is that we're over-medicated, we're sick, we're, we're obese, we're under-exercised, we're over-sedentized, we're under -sleptitized. That's a big fancy word for sleep. And uh, that's just kind of the reality of where we are. So to me, <clears throat> when you look at just about any study that's out there, it indicates that more plants will reduce your risk of overall mortality, whether it's cancer, heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, right? More fruits, more vegetables, more whole, whole grains, more beans will head you in the right direction. When you eat more processed meats, more meat, more dairy products, all those numbers when it comes to cancer, heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, they all start to go up. So not very good. So let's talk about plants, why we love plants and why your life depends on more plants. So I love to say, and you've probably heard me say this a number of times, but I'm going to say it again. Plants is where the true deep dive in nutrition lives. This is where all the glory is found. This is the mother source of all that is good and beneficial and healthy and strong when it comes to nutrition. And we all were raised thinking that strong food was meat for protein, dairy for calcium, you know, oils to be heart healthy, to be brain healthy. Uh, and the reality is these are not strong foods. These are the weak foods that we want to relegate to the back burner, right? Literally the true strong foods are the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains, the beans. These are the super superheroes that are going to elevate our, our health and help mitigate and prevent us from coming down with the cancers, the diabetes, the cardiovascular disease and the Alzheimer's. So, but I wanna take this a step further with you all. And that is the reason why we really, 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 really love whole plants is because this is the true mother's source, right? So we wanna eat fruits and vegetables and whole grains and beans as close to grown as possible that are minimally processed. And this way, this will ensure that we're getting everything that we want that's beneficial. So I'm talking about sweet potatoes, grapes, broccoli, kale, Swiss chard, uh, pinto beans, black beans, navy beans, lentils, oranges, bananas, apples, brown rice, quinoa, farro, barley, right? All these wonderful whole plant-based foods. What I'm not talking about here, gang, is I'm not talking about French fries, right? Let's pivot to potatoes, not French fries. I'm not talking about the fake cheeses like the diet cheeses that are out there. All this stuff that I'm talking about right now, these may be plant-based, but they are, they are calorie rich and very processed and they can be just as detrimental to your health as the animal-based products. So I'm also talking about donuts, right? All the vegan donuts and the, and the pastries uh, that are out there right now. It's just flour, sugar, and, um, and oil, all right? Uh, I'm talking about all the ice creams that are out there. Ben & Jerry's now has 11 varieties of plant-based ice creams that are out there, but it's all loaded with coconut milk, coconut fat, it's loaded with saturated fat. So it's creamy. It's got that mouthfeel, but don't let them pull the wool over your eyes or rather pull the saturated fat over your eyes. Don't fall for it. All the veggie burgers that are out there, specifically, I'm talking about the Impossible and the Beyond that are really just Franken burgers with no whole food ingredients in them. Um, yes, there may be a time and a place for these. They can sometimes act as transition foods 
But if you're doing the beyond balls, the beyond burgers, you know, um, the impossible nuggets, uh, three or four nights a week, that is a problem and that's going to hurt you. Um, I'm also talking about alcohol here, right? Alcohol is not the Mediterranean French super, uh, super drink. Uh, it is a known toxin to every organ of the body. It's about 120 calories per serving. And uh, it's just basically simple sugars that inhibit our body's ability to burn fat by about 30%. So I want you all to be really, really judicious with the alcohol. Cereals. There's so many cereals that are screaming, I'm healthy, you know, you know, me, 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 me. And the reality is, is that most of these cereals on the shelves are just posers. They're not true, healthy cereals. Buttery spreads. Uh, there's so many of these vegan buttery spreads, like the Earth Balance spread, 100 calories per tablespoon. First and second ingredients are usually some sort of oil, canola oil, palm oil. And these are going to really um, do a number on you. Fried chips. Yeah, we all love, right? Dipping those chips in salsa, in guacamole. But make your own out of corn tortillas. Don't buy the fried ones that are 50% fat and loaded with all kinds of oils. And then, of course, we've got all the different glorified candy bars that are out there that are just calorie dense and for the most part processed. So be super careful about uh, snacking on too many of the candy bars slash bars that are out there right now. And you all know how I how I feel about oils, whether it's olive, safflower, sunflower, uh, avocado, flax, walnut, 120 calories per tablespoon. And um, these oils are to the fat world what sugar is to the carbohydrate world, just empty calories with no nutritional oomph to speak of whatsoever. So now let me dive into what I love about whole plant-based foods and why your life depends on them. They we're going to break 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 this down into two categories, macronutrients and micronutrients. Now, macronutrients, right? Big, large um they have calories and I'm talking about protein, carbohydrates and fat. And for the most part, almost all foods have protein, carbohydrates, and fat. The exception is meat. Meat, uh, animal meat basically just has fat and protein. It has no carbohydrates. Now, that's not a good thing, right? Our primary fuel source as human beings are, is glucose. It's sugars. It's carbs. So... Um, don't think that meat is a healthy product because it doesn't have carbohydrates. The protein that it does have is kind of janky. It's messed up. It raises cholesterol levels. It's going to do a real number on your kidneys and your liver. It, uh, it siphons calcium from your bones to buffer the acid load. Um, and, uh, just not a very smart, intelligent form of protein. On the other hand, you look at plants and plants, it, are com all plants are a complete protein. Don't let that fool you. And it's got the perfect combination of the essential amino acids and the perfect proportion and composition that all of us need without wreaking any havoc on us. So I like to think of plant-based protein as the absolute Goldilocks, Goldilocks when it comes to a protein. Now, when it comes to carbohydrates, carbohydrates have gotten a kind of a, a bad rap. And because of how we eat carbohydrates in America, deservedly so, the carbs that we want to ingest come from whole plant-based foods. So I'm talking about that list that I, that, I, um, that I talked about recently, right? Grapes, sweet potatoes, pinto beans, black beans, bananas, apples, uh, brown rice, steel cut oats. These are the type of carbohydrates our bodies need and will run off very efficiently. What we don't like are the white rice, the white pasta, the white sugar, the donuts, the, the soda pops, all these things. These are problematic. Now, when it comes to fats, plants are running and humming on the perfect fats there's almost no trans, there's no trans fats in, in plant-based products. 
whole plant-based products. You have very little to no saturated fat unless you're really going down on the nuts and specifically the coconuts. The coconuts are the one big exception there. But otherwise, for the most part, plant-based foods have no saturated fat. But what they are teeming in is wonderful, delicious, essential um, polyunsaturated fatty acids. These are the, the omega-6s and the omega-3s that our bodies need to get from food. Now, the exception to this rule is oils and all this processed and refined plant-based foods. Because when you eat a lot of oil and calorie-rich and processed foods, it throws this very delicate omega-6 to omega-3 balance in disarray. And then we typically like to have a, a balance of omega-6s to omega-3s of, of a ratio of one to one, two to one, three to one, omega-6s to omega-3s. However, when you start adding in all the oils, a, a tablespoon of olive, a tablespoon of uh, canola, you're eating packaged and boxed and canned foods where the second, third, and eighth ingredient are some kind of, some type of oils, all of a sudden that delicate ratio of sixes to threes goes to like 15 to one or 20 to one or 30 to one. And this promotes all kinds of inflammation, which as we know then leads to chronic Western disease. So the protein that you're getting from whole plant-based foods is the Goldilocks version. It's completely complete and you're getting all you need. You're getting romping healthy, uh, unprocessed, unrefined carbohydrates that fuel our 10 trillion plus cells in our body. And you're also getting the ideal essential fat, fat, the essential polyunsaturated fatty acids that we need as human beings. So we're covered when it comes to the macronutrients. Let's now look at micronutrients. Now, micronutrients have no calories in them, but they're essential for us to take our health to the next level. And I'm talking about vitamins. There's really 13 vitamins that we need as human beings. Of those 13 vitamins, 11, 11 originate from plants. 11 of them. The two exceptions are vitamin B12, which I'm sure most of you know comes from the micronutrients, uh, microorganisms in the soil, right? And then vitamin D, which is the sunshine vitamin, which is really more of a hormone. So you take a little supplement that costs you $15 a year on your B12, and then you get enough sunshine and you're totally set. Um, so when it comes to vitamins, plants are, again, they're the mother source. They're the originator. When it comes to minerals, there's basically 17 major and minor minerals that are out there between your potassium, your sodium, your your calcium, your magnesium, um, all these things. And I love to say that minerals originate, right, in the soil. This is where, they, where they're formed. Plants grow and romp in the soil. So the best way for you to get your retainable, absorbable calcium, magnesium, iron, all these things is from plants. It's not from animals, okay? Now, next, let's move on to antioxidants. It's well known that plants on average have 64 times, that's an X, times, not a plus sign, X, 64 times more antioxidants than animal-based products. And these antioxidants, they are going to basically, um, they're going to mitigate oxidative damage that's caused from pollution, from just us living, from us breathing. All right. Super, super important. And the same thing with phytonutrients, phytochemicals. It's a big fancy name for plant nutrients or plant chemicals. There's over 20,000 known that exist and they exist only in plants. And they're kind of like another, another form of antioxidants that help mitigate oxidative damage, prevent DNA uh, damage, and help prevent chronic Western disease. So when you're when you're really like rifling in the steel cut oats and the sweet potatoes and the kale, the Swiss chard, the broccoli, and all these things, you are getting all the vitamins, all the minerals, all the antioxidants, 
and just crushing it with phytonutrients, it's like you're making yourself a bullet, a bulletproof fortress from these chronic Western diseases. And that's incredibly, incredibly exciting. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is fiber. Fiber has no calories, but you know, we are just now starting to realize all the myriad benefits that fiber brings to us as, as human beings. Um, you know, I talked about this when I talked about fiber a couple of weeks ago, but I'm going to repeat it. The American Gut Project that followed over 10,000 people for a number of years around the world determined that the number one factor in determining gut health was the number and variety of different whole plant-based foods you were able to consume in a week. And that also included herbs and spices. And that magic number was 30. So believe it or not, that's not hard to do. But I want you to know that your life and your gut and your autoimmune system depend, right, on you trying to achieve this number. Um, I want you to think of it in this way. More plants equals more good bacteria, more good back, more good gut bacteria equates to a stronger immune system and a stronger immune system equates to a healthier and a more vibrant life for you. When you are eating all these whole wonderful plant-based foods that are just loaded with soluble and insoluble fiber, what it's doing, it it's drawing out toxins from our system. It is bringing down your cholesterol levels. It is keeping us as regular as Swiss commuter trains. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're off to the races. It helps prevent colorectal cancer, right? Instead of, instead of having that fecal matter like rub up against the intestinal wall uh, and be there for days at a time, creating those polyps that then turn into problematic cancers, you are just constantly ushering through all that uh, fecal matter and it's not an issue anymore. Uh, it also helps keep us satiated. You know, when you eat that fiber and it combines with water, it has this wonderful bulking effect that keeps us satiated. Uh, it helps regulate blood sugar levels. Anybody that has these wild swings in blood sugar levels, start eating more whole plant-based foods and all of a sudden it will level out your energy. It's a wonderful thing. Um, just kind of in the same vein as keeping you regular, when you're consuming all this fiber, because it's so bulky, it also creates uh, and stimulates the intestines by creating a, a something called peristalsis, which is basically this contraction that occurs when you have a certain amount of mass and bulk and water in your intestines. And you also are creating this wonderful, healthy gut garden that is creating a fortress, a fortress uh, of an immune system for you. And it also helps prevent uh, any kind of you know, leaky gut. So all these things are wonderful. And then of course, when you're eating whole plant-based foods, you're also getting a tremendous amount of water that's just naturally inherent in these fruits and these vegetables and, uh, and these whole grains that we cook in water and the same thing with, um, with the beans. Um, so I have kind of gone off on a bit of a diatribe there about plants, but you know, they are just, they are nature's secret to everything that is healthy and bountiful and wonderful in the world of nutrition. And, you know, I want you all to know, eat more plants because your life truly depends on it. So with that, I'd love to see if there's any, any question that you guys would like to shoot me. Uh, and let me just take a peek here. I'm looking best to see what we got. Uh, let's see. 
I'm looking, I'm looking. Um, <laughs> uh, my question, this is from Karen Wright. Um, will somebody let me know if I'm live? There we are. Well, I am. Okay, good, good. Let me just expand my window here uh, so I can see these questions. Yeah. Uh, raw vegan folks say cooking any veggies kills them and it kills all the en enzymes. Do you believe this? Is this thinking militant? I uh, I have me fearing any cooked foods. Hey, Karen, really good question. And uh, I can tell you that when I if I was to break down what I eat in a day, I would say that half of it is cooked and half of it is raw. Uh, please do not be spooked by cooking your foods. We know that when we cook certain foods, it enhances the, um, the nutritional profile of those foods. Um, Yes, sometimes it may diminish them, but you know what? If you're eating a predominantly whole food plant-based diet, whether it's cooked, whether it's raw, uh, you are going to be crushing it. You know, and there's a whole another philosophy is the the um, macrobiotic philosophy where they actually want everything to be cooked because it helps with digestion. So there's different philosophies, obviously, when it comes to raw versus cooked. Uh, and I would tell you that, you know, if you want to mess around with them all, go ahead, but don't be spooked into thinking that you're not getting enough nutrients and that they're somehow, um, they've been diminished or blocked when you cook them. All right. That's my answer to that one. Yeah. Um, Gelaginous says, I've been whole food, plant-based, no oil for three years, and my triglycerides are still over 200. Any ideas? Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. So what I have found is that uh, any if you're doing gelat, uh, gelaginous, uh, if you could answer this, and then best if you could put his answer in here, how many different smoothies are you doing a week, and how many glasses of wine or beer or alcohol are you having a week? All right. That would be my first question to you. And that is because alcohol will raise those triglycerides through the roof. Uh, if you have a glass of wine or a beer the night before you get tested, you can expect those triglycerides to be between two to 400 easily, right? Just from that one glass. And then if you're doing smoothies, if you're juicing it, you're your, our bodies have a hard time with all that sugar. And again, that's what alcohol is. It's simple sugars. That's what those smoothies are. That's what those juices are. And they come without the fiber. So that's a real, a real problem. So I would tell you, stop the alcohol, stop the smoothies, stop the juicing, and you'll see those triglycerides come down tremendously. The other thing that hurts triglycerides are if you're doing white bread, if you're doing a lot of white sugar, if you're doing um, jams, things of that nature. All right. Uh, how do you get more collagen with plants? Is it algae? Marley Mar, I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, I don't worry about collagen. It seems to be the rage right now. And I am very, um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm very ignorant when it comes to collagen. So that, there you go on that one. Um, so can unsaturated oils affect cholesterol levels? Um, so I, I guess you're talking about the mon monounsaturated and the polyunsaturated. Um, you know, I will tell you that yes, especially if you're overdoing it, absolutely it will affect cholesterol levels. Um, there's been some pretty powerful research done and uh, I cannot remember the name of the gentleman that did it, but he actually was able to show that monounsaturated fats actually can cause atherosclerosis at almost the exact same uh, rate as, um, as saturated fats. So. Uh, just because something is an unsaturated fat uh, doesn't necessarily mean 
that you can go hog wild on it. All right. Hi, Rip. Uh, I wonder if you could please advise on eating fruits, vegetables while someone is on as, yeah, when it is very difficult to eat anything more than a tiny amount per meal, what calorie dense, nutritionally whole food would you recommend? So I have no idea what those medications are and what they, uh, what the side effects are. So I guess it affects your, uh, your appetite is what you're saying there, Miriam. And, um, so if you're trying to eat more calorie dense, I can tell you that it's going to be your, your potatoes, your beans. Uh, obviously if, if, if gaining weight is an issue, they'll probably want to do, um, more of the whole grain breads, pastas, um, and, um, and maybe even some nuts and seeds and avocados. Yeah. Congratulations getting into Wegmans. Team up with your mom and your sister and bring them to Rochester, New York, which is the home of Wegmans. I'd love to meet with you. Thanks, Debbie, so much. You know, what we just launched into Wegmans is our chilies and stews. It's our, uh, our firehouse chili, our creamy white bean chili, and also our Indian lentil stew and our Thai carrot chickpea stew. Super proud to get those into Wegmans. They're also available, as Bess is showing you all, online. Uh, and they are quick heat and eat meals. You simply just push up the, the, uh, the ends, tear the perforated, um, the ter the perforated <clears throat> line along the top, pour it into your microwavable bowl, and you are good to go for a quick lunch or dinner over brown rice or green leafies or something like that. Um, tell us your view on coconut-based foods, yogurt, coconut water, et cetera. Andrea, great question. And, you know, we did a whole podcast on, on coconuts with, uh, with, with uh, a woman on my team, Jess Hegarty. Listen to it. It's a really powerful 40 minutes. Actually, it, we did it as a, a, a Friday Facebook Live a couple of weeks ago, but it's a really incredible slideshow and deck that we put together for you there. But I can tell you just in a, in a, coconut shell that we stay away from the coconut. It's got more saturated fat than any food on the planet. And all iterations of coconut are problematic. Uh, even coconut water is just basically sugar water at 60 calories a, a serving. Coconut milk, coconut yogurt, coconut oil, all of this is just loaded with saturated fat. You know, the one exception to the rule might be, might be coconut sugar uh, I, I'm trying to remember where we landed with coconut flour, but, uh, most coconut items, uh, we're not buying it. Can familiar, uh, familial high cholesterolemia be reversed? I am whole food plant-based in the oil and can't get my total below 200. So Janice, yeah, uh, I would, you know, you guys know I'm not a doctor, um, but I hang out with, <laughs> with a lot of doctors. And I've heard my father talk about this a whole bunch. And um, it can't be reversed. But what you can do is by eating whole food plant-based, you can do everything in your power to make sure that you're not allowing um, the, 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 LDL, the LDL, which is those lethal cholesterols, to burrow down and promote uh, plaque formation. And so really the most important thing is what's passing through your lips, um, it's not necessarily how high that cholesterol is in most cases. So all is not for not, you can do everything in your power to help prevent yourself from going down that cardiovascular disease path. But you more than most people have to be super careful with, uh, with what you're eating and what's passing through your lips. Are flax and chia enough fats to get that boost in nutrient absorption for fat-soluble nutrients? I would tell you that um, there's enough fat in almost every whole plant-based food to get that nutrient absorption. We really only need 3 to 5% of our calories coming from the polyunsaturated essential fatty acids. And if you're eating fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, you're going to be getting that minimum easily. So um, the answer to your question is definitely yes. 
What do you think about quinoa? Good. Yeah, I think quinoa is great. Uh, I think it's a great substitution for 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 brown rice to mix it up for um, for barley for farro. Um, I'm a fan of quinoa for sure. Yes. Our Lisa Scott, our nut butters, okay, used minimally. You know, I would tell you this is a personal question depending upon what your goals are. Whether you're trying to, you know, if you're an athlete, then I would, you know, and you don't have elevated cholesterol or heart disease, then uh, I would say absolutely. Um, if you're somebody that's diabetic, you're overweight, I would not do nut butters. Instead, I would do the PB2 that has been defatted and uh, has a fraction of the fat that nut butters do. So that's probably a smarter route for those people to go in. What do you think of Satan and do you make it ever? So uh, Teddy Boo Boo, love that name. Um, I do not make Satan. However, I do consume Satan. We probably have it once a month at our house in uh, when we do stir fries, and you know it's um, it's it's lightly processed. It comes from gluten. Uh, it's about eighty percent protein. You know, the Buddhists used to call it uh, uh, like Buddha meat because it's got such a similar texture and flavor profile and that umami taste. Um, but I don't overdo the seitan, but I do do it probably once a month with the family. Uh, what's a good way to make the switch to a plant-based diet? Heather Campbell. Um, I'll tell you that this too is very personalized. If you're the type of person that likes to do things and you go all in, then just, as I say in my first book, The Engine 2 Diet, um, I have two paths, the firefighter or the fire cadet. The firefighter jumps in from day one, whole kale, and abstains from all the meat, the dairy, the processed refined foods, and you're focusing in on whole plant-based foods. And I find when you do this, you get to see the results immediately. You're not ever, you know, having to arm wrestle with your palate because your palate changes very, very quickly. We have about 10,000 taste buds in our tongue and those receptors and those taste buds uh, will adapt very quickly when you're all in. Now, what I find is a little bit more arduous, but some people prefer to go the slower route is when you just kind of slowly, week by week by week, you remove the offending uh, food group. So day, week one, you're removing all, all meat, but you're still doing dairy. You're still doing some processed refined foods. Day Week two, you remove the meat and you remove the dairy products, but you're still doing the oils and some of the processed refined plant-based foods. Week three, you remove all that stuff. And then week four, you're, you're all in. So I would recommend um, doing one of those two paths for a month. And then in either case, do before and after biometric screenings. So you can see with your own eyes what happens and what can happen in a very, very short period of time. All right. Uh, Bess, why don't we take two more questions and then I got I to gotta, I gotta run. What are your cholesterol numbers, Rip? Brett, the audacity of you asking that. And that's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking. So I usually get my, my numbers checked once a year. The last time I had it checked, it was my total was 136. My LDL was somewhere right around 68. My HDL, which my, my HDLs are typically super, uh, super low was about 36. And my triglycerides were about 130. So I'm super happy with those numbers. Um, you know, the triglycerides, we typically want those below 150. I and know that I typically have eight to 10 pieces of fruit a day. Our total cholesterol, you know, if we don't have uh, a high HDL, we love those total cholesterol numbers to be below 150. And the, uh, and the LDL, we like to see those below 80. Okay, let's take one more question and then we're going to call it good. Do you use or recommend any supplements? Deborah, thank you so much for the question. You know, this all depends. If you have a known deficiency, 
then definitely there, there, there's probably going to be a need to supplement. But I can tell you that most of these meta analyses that are out there shows that show that supplementation with uh, vitamin A, vitamin C, um, again, unless there's a deficiency, um, in, in some cases, vitamin D, selenium, do more harm than good when you supplement with these. And it's because the human body doesn't recognize these and they're in these quantities, these huge quantities, but they recognize them when they're in their whole, when you eat them and consume them in their whole food, um, whole food part. So the one thing that everybody agrees that you should supplement with is vitamin B12 because um, whether you're a meat eater or whether you're, you know, just a, a plant-based eater, everybody can, can use B12 because the food supply is so clean these days, or meaning our fruits and vegetables. The, the dirt has basically been knocked off them and those microorganisms are no longer there in the, in the quantities that we need them to be. So what my father and Dr. Greger and Michael Clapper recommend is typically somewhere between a 500 microgram to a 5,000 microgram. If you're doing 5,000, just do it once a week. If you're doing 500, you can do it three times a week and a hundred, you can do it every day. Um, and it'll cost you like 15 bucks a year. So the B12, yes, and everything else, it's kind of a matter of, you know, what you're comfortable with and if there's, if there is in fact a deficiency. All right. Say, <laughs> Bess, you heard me. All right, everybody, listen, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. Remember, eat more plants, eat strong food. Your life depends on it. Look forward to seeing you next Friday. And, um, Keep it planned strong until then.